who are new, the habit is to pick a book and work through the book verse by verse, passage by passage. Uh, the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible, not man. I didn't write the Bible. Uh, and it's much better to go through this and we encounter different things along the way. Acts is basically a history. Uh, it's not necessarily a do this and don't do this, but rather it's called a uh, narrative. Some people will say that. It's kind of like telling a story, right? But it's the acts, actions, not like you know chopping down a tree, but actions of what happened after Christ ascended. The apostles go out and... Here we are. <laughs> they went on mission, they built churches, and they proclaimed the word of God. They proclaimed that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the promised one, the one who is going to fix all the problems because there's problems in the world, right? There's world, there's wars and death and suffering, disease. We sin against each other. We are sinned against. There's victimizers. There's victims. There's all sorts of massive problems. It's been going on for, well, thousands and thousands of years. The only way to solve that is for God himself to step in to this creation. That's what Christ did some 2,000 years ago. That's why we celebrate Christmas even in the West. That's the whole thing. Not Christmas uh, trees and Santa Claus, but Christ coming into the world to save sinners. So we see these five individuals here. And there, this is the first mission trip. And again, if you're taking notes, this is kind of a micro-series within Acts. It's the first missionary journey. This is part two. And it's subtitled conversion amongst opposition so conversion amongst opposition and again there's notes in the back there if you want there's also bathrooms on the right there as you uh, by the double doors if you need that too but there's much opposition and if you caught that right away we have paul and barnabas or saul and barnabas and they're going through they were sent out from jerusalem and those of us who have maps this is the mediterranean sea this is whole area where this was first the gospel was fully proclaimed Israel's here Jerusalem basically right in the middle they went this way so there's a little island called Cyprus Cyprus is still an island today it is 75% Christian believe it or not 75% Christian 25% Muslim but the testimony of what these men were doing even then still lasting this happens probably around 62 AD, so it's about 30 years after Jesus was crucified and resurrected. So Acts spans a pretty big chunk of time. Um, yeah, it's about 15 or so years, 20 years, depending on where you look at it. But it's the actions of what's going on, kind of like a history book. So Cyprus here is 75% Christian today. And these men are here are on this missionary journey. Now, there are other Christians in Cyprus, but notice the habit, it says they went to the synagogues, and that's Paul's habit. We have John Mark, which is Barnabas' cousin. We know that from later. So there's two points I want to see from this section, two points that we can look at how we're to understand what's going on, because it's not written to us, but the Bible is written for us. Right? We don't just get to make up whatever it is, just like if you were to write a note to somebody or an email. Somebody else doesn't get to say, well, you meant this, right? The author is the one who intends what the meaning of the words are, right? You might use a nickname or a phrase or something and, you know, between you and your wife or you and your friend or something, and you know exactly what you mean or she knows what you mean. But if somebody else might read it 2,000 years from now and not have any idea, but if they know who you are in the cultural context and Kentucky in 2022, like, oh, that's what they mean. They don't mean this, they actually mean that. So the author is the one who gets to decide what it means. And since God's the author, he decides, right? A lot of this is just trying to figure out the cultural relevance of what's happening then, because we're not in Israel, right? We're not living 2,000 years ago. So we need to understand what's happening, what these words mean, how these people are. and We just kind of breeze right past these certain instances a lot of times, and we don't really understand what it means for them and what it means for us. And so it's good to do the background. I'm not inventing it. It's what scholars smarter than me will look at history and other contemporary things and look at and understand. So two points we can see, again, verses 6 through 8, false teaching always opposes truth. False teaching always opposes truth. And then truth always triumphs, verses 9 through 12. Truth always triumphs. 
So looking quickly, we looked at three and four last week, or four and five rather, and we do have sermons online if you're interested. They're on our website. But we looked at one through five, and there's a little bit of overlap, so I read from four. But we're examining again six. So they go to island of, uh, uh, of Cyprus. They go to the east coast. You can see it even on there, Salamis, and then they go all the way to Paphos. The whole island's about 140 miles physically, but they travel about 90 miles. Now, there's no cars, right? Of course, we all know that, but we think it's so easy. It's going to be here to Litchfield or here to Louisville or whatever, E-Town. It's easy, right? We get in our car and we drive. It's smooth roads. We've got gas, AC. Everything's nice. Well, they didn't have any of that. And I know that we all probably know that, but sometimes we think we just kind of breeze right past it, and that's kind of even how Luke does. But that's not his focus. It's not his focus to say they went through the whole island of Cyprus, but that's what it says, right? Well, that's pretty exhaustive. They went through the whole island. Even if they made a beeline, 90 miles is still a long time. And you're talking to people and going to the synagogues, which is just a gathering of, of Jewish people and other God-fearing people that aren't necessarily Jewish, kind of like church we do today, just a gathering of people. And so they went, and they went through the whole island. But... It says they came upon a magician. Some translations say sorcerer. I kind of like that better because it really kind of conjures up a thing of, of something deeper than just a guy doing magic tricks. And we think of a guy on the street or, you know, doing little card tricks or somebody on TV or, you know, YouTube video or something. But he's doing something that's more than just a sleight of hand, you know, trick, whatever. We're talking about demonic powers and entities, a supernatural tear through. We live in a world that's not naturalistic. Most people believe that. Most, you know, scientific people so-called believe it's only in the five senses. We can't see anything else. This is why most people reject Christ. They reject God. They don't think God can send himself and be and, and become a man and dwell among us and save us from our sin. Well, if you start with the premise that there is no God, well, then there is no God to do that, right? But we don't live in just a merely materialistic world. It's impossible to reconcile things like love or hate. It's impossible to really understand why we get mad or sad at the death of a small child or the death of a spouse or wars. Naturalistic understanding doesn't give an answer to that. There's no reason. Squirrels don't care. Nobody's mourning their friend that just got smashed. We passed like, you know, three dead ones on the way here, right? And we see it all the time. Deer... I hit a frog last night. It was leaping, and I, I thought it was a leaf, but he was doing this thing, and I just plowed right over him. Nobody cares. I guarantee you, no other frogs care. But they're animals, right? And, you know, they're, okay, we eat them and whatever. We don't really care, right? <laughs> they taste good, usually. But people, well, it's different, because people are made in God's image. People are made in the likeness of God, both men and women, boys and girls. And we have value and worth. That's why abortion's wrong. That's why it's wrong to kill old people. That's why you don't just shoot somebody in the face and take their car. That's why we have the laws we have, thankfully. They respect the things that have already been given by the Lord. This is where our rights come from. Not from government. Not from the church. Not from some corporation, but from God himself. And so we see this magician, and that's kind of a sidetrack, but he is engaging with supernatural powers. We see this other places where Paul is writing, who's Saul here, and he says, we don't really wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't really argue about these little trivial things. Because again, if there is no God, it doesn't really matter. We're all just material. We're all just dust. Nobody really cares about the squirrel on the side of the road, right? We're not losing sleep over it. But a small child. We just prayed earlier for a little boy who needs liver He's having liver problems. He's only three years old. That breaks my heart. But that's because we live in a fallen world, not because of his own sin, but because as we sang, even Adam and Eve, the first people, broke the law. They disobeyed. God cursed the ground, and it then calls back out to him for redemption. Because we can't fix it. We're the ones who caused the problem. We can't fix it. Only God can. That's why Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to redeem the creation other places, the Bible talks about the whole creation groans. It's like a woman ready to give birth. She's in pain. It's, it's terrible. But then the baby comes and she forgets all about that pain. Well, that's the redemption. We're waiting for Jesus. When Jesus comes, we'll forget all about the pain. All the, more, all the suffering that's gone. All the wars and, and the problems and the sickness. 
It'll all be gone when Christ returns. But in the meantime, there's work to do. And these are the men who are part of that work nearly 2,000 years ago. So they engage this magician. They're in Paphos, they're in the western city. It's the biggest area. It's run by Rome, because remember, Rome is kind of like how England was hundreds of years ago, kind of how America is today, a power, right, an empire. It's nothing new. Babylon and Egypt and others did it before us. And they're there running Cyprus. And there's this magician, and he's kind of in this court of the proconsul. He's a governor, but like a senator governor. Like we have our independent you know, state here in Kentucky, and you know, the federal government doesn't really get to tell us a whole lot, although we pretend like they do. But we have a governor we elect. But then we also have senators we send to Washington as representatives, right? So he's kind of like both a senator and governor. Now those are, of course, in Judea, where Jerusalem is. But that's a much more hostile, terrible place. Riots all the time. And we see this through the Gospels. Always having problems. That's where there's a lot of military. Cyprus isn't. Cyprus wasn't really. That's what a proconsul was. They were there just kind of patting everybody on the back and saying, good job. There really isn't need for any military stuff here. Cyprus is a very pretty area, and it was then, and it is now, likely was then, but is now today. So Sergius Paulus is there, and he's got counselors and people, just like our governor does, our president does. But this man is a magician. And since he's Jewish, he has this God from the Old Testament, right? the, the Hebrew God. And that's, what, that's how um, the proconsul would see him. He would say, oh, I respect all gods, because Romans were polytheistic, poly meaning many, many gods. So he's like, well, yeah, bring in one more god. Yeah, that sounds good. Yahweh, that. Oh, you do tricks, too. Cool, I like tricks. What do you got? Now, it doesn't say exactly what he's doing, but he's a magician. He's a sorcerer, and he's doing these things. So he's there, and his name is Bar-Jesus. Now, of course, uh, that might seem like, well, I mean, he's like against Jesus, like Antichrist, right? Bar is just son of. In fact, we see Barnabas right here is son of encouragement, son of Abbas. Abbas being encouragement. Simon Bar-Jonah is Peter, the apostle's name. He's the son of Jonah. So Jesus here, of course, isn't the only Jesus, like Jesus the Christ on the cross, right? Jesus, Jesus. There's all sorts of other Jesuses, right? Remember, the angel appears to Mary and says, you'll call him Jesus. It's like the name John or Dave, right? Like William, right? There, we know lots of those. And so, same type of thing here. There was another Jesus called Justice in the Gospels as well, so it's a common name. So this guy's dad's name's Jesus, or better, Yeshua, or Yahshua, who means deliverer or savior. So he's the son of the savior. Now, was his dad Jesus? No, that's not what this is saying, not like Jesus the Christ. It's just a guy named Jesus, or Yahshua. Well, it's the same Joshua idea that came after Moses in the Old Testament. Remember, Moses dies, and he takes them into the promised land. So he's there, and he delivers them. He saves Israel, brings them in to Canaan. And so we see that Saul is opposing this opposer, which we'll get to in a moment. But this guy opposes them. He was with the proconsul. It means he's just there. He's, he's, in the, he's a friend of, and he's a counselor. He says, hey, we should do this, we should do this, and so on. So verse 7, he says, he's there. Sergius Paulus is a man of intelligence. And he summoned Barnabas and Saul. Now, this is probably because they were traveling philosophers, very common. Remember, there's no TV, there's no phones. That people would just sit around and do this, but all day long. Right? Tell us something new. Tell us about this. Tell us about the world. Right? There's no other entertainment. Of course, they had gladiatorial games and animals and races and other things like that. But they would do sitting down and listening. We'll see this later in later chapters, chapter 17 in particular of Acts. So he's here and Sergius Paul says, hey guys, come on. I want to hear about this God too. I, it's probably the same God, right? Because you guys are Jewish and this, this uh, Bar Jesus guy, he's Jewish too. You guys should probably get to know each other. Shake some hands, have some meal, you know, hang out, probably have stuff in common. Sergius Paul probably has no idea, right? He probably, had, you're all the same. Like, I don't know, just bring more gods in. I want, to, I want power and might. But what happens? Verse 8. What's it say? But Elymas, the magician, Bar-Jesus, 
opposed them. So he's not really actually being an authentic Jew. Because authentic Jews, just like anybody who else worships Christ in general, worship God because he first revealed himself to the, the tribe the tribes of Israel. He picked out a people to be a light to everybody else, to say, hey, I'm the creator, this is how you should live, tell everybody else. They didn't do a very good job, but that was their mission. So this guy isn't really authentically Jewish. He's just name only. Many people today, Christian only. Right? I don't really actually do any of the Christ-loving stuff. I do these other things, just name only. Like if I were tell you I'm a big UK Wildcats fan and I watch basketball all the time and then you're like well what's your favorite player and I would tell you oh, I don't know you know okay you know well you know how many games you go to you go to the games or watch the games I mean I don't really go to the games so, so you watch them no not really well you listen to them then, like on the radio or like online or no but I'm a huge fan like you'd all be like what are you talking about like no you're not based on your actions right so that's what it is with a lot of times people claiming to know Christ. And that's how Sergius Paul says here with being Jewish. So he opposes them, though he's in the inner circle. He says, proconsul, probably, you know, ah, no, dude, you shouldn't. Nah, you don't need to hear those guys. I've got enough. I'm, I'm good. Me and, you know, the other guys, there's probably other counsel, counselors, sorry, um, you know, people who are influencing him. You don't need to hear anybody else. Nah, you guys are good. We're good. We're good. He opposes them, though. That's an aggressive word there in the original language. And seeking to turn him away from the faith. So he's wanting to hear about Jesus. He wants to hear about this redemption thing. This, this Christian, and no doubt Pope Council Sergius Paulus, has seen other Christians and seen people worshiping idols and sacrificing to dead demon gods and all sorts of other things. And they're changed, and then things are different. Their lives are different. Their families are different. Their attitudes, their work ethic, it's all different. And that's what happens today. It even happens still, because that's the power of God to salvation to all who believe. Every single person, man, woman, old, young, boy, girl, doesn't matter. Any ethnicity doesn't matter. Anybody can come to the knowledge of the truth. But when you do, things are different. Things change. Sometimes slowly, sometimes radically. But you're changed. If you're exactly the same way, but you're professing Christ, you're probably not actually, you probably don't know him. So he calls them, though, because he wants to hear more. And Elymas opposes him. So we can see that bar Jesus likely know the power of God to salvation. And again, if you're taking notes and like to fill it in, that's one of the fill-ins. Bar Jesus likely knew the power of God to salvation. And that power of God isn't works. It's not being a better person or going to church or giving X, Y, Z amount to an organization or praying so many times or so frequently or telling this or that or doing the work. Rather, it's belief. It's belief in God. And it's not a belief, I believe in God, because demonic powers believe in God, the scripture says, but rather a belief that you trust you trust that person. Not just a mere, yeah, okay, I understand who that person is, or yeah, he exists. But rather a trusting. That's what belief is. You're putting your faith in God. So we see that he is opposing them. And it's likely financial. It doesn't say that, but this is the guess. Because he's there in the court, and as advisors, you get paid, right? There's all sorts of counselors and advisors, and you know, you hear about this guy that goes to advise Microsoft or some other Fortune 500 company, and they make you know $100,000 for their little one-time, one-week seminar thing, or they're telling people about their HR problems and how they can solve them, and they pay them 200 grand, and you're like, how do you get those jobs, right? Like, you ever hear about these, right? And they don't barely do anything, and they're there for a couple hours, and they're advising. Like, oh, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a consultant. Like, what do you, what do you, I, I want to be a consultant. Like, that sounds kind of easy, right? Well, that's kind of what he's doing, and he's getting paid well. But if Sergius Paulus turns to Christ, he's no longer going to consult all these demon god guys. Sorry? Right? He's not. 
make everybody wake up. Nobody's sleeping. This is great. Um, if he turns to Jesus, things will change. And Elymas will be out of a job. So it's financial. We see this in Acts 19 with Demetrius the silversmith. I won't read it for time, but if you're taking notes, it's Acts 19, 24 and following. He basically gets everybody together and says, hey, we make silver shrines to Artemis, a false goddess. And that's a good business, guys. We need to shut these other guys up who are talking about Jesus because these people are turning to Jesus and they're not worshiping Artemis. And if they don't worship Artemis, they're not going to buy our idols. And if they don't buy our idols, I'm out of a job. And this happens today, doesn't it? All the time. All the time. The yellow brick road there in Wizard of Oz is actually a euphemism for money, for gold. Follow the yellow brick road. Where does the money go? Follow the money. We ever heard that? Where does the money go? And you'll actually see what the actual route is. Where does it lead? And that's what it is. So Sergius Paulus wants to hear the truth. So what does this mean specifically for us? Children included. Adults, children, doesn't matter. Sergius Paulus wants to hear the truth and later embraces it. We'll see in a moment. But bar Jesus doesn't. So who are we? Are you going to seek and embrace the truth or are you going to oppose it and oppose those who proclaim it? That's the question. Sadly, even many in our own convention want to say they're doing one thing but are doing something different. They want to say that they're speaking and preaching the gospel, but in, by their words and deeds, they're actually denying Christ. Which will lead us right now to verse 9 and our second point. Our second point, we see that the truth always triumphs. Because God ultimately wins. Though we're in this middle, and it's, we're still stuck, and there's problems and triumphs and, 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 and victories and sorrows... But truth ultimately wins. It doesn't mean we don't just sit, just lay down, just, well, whatever, right? But rather, we work. And as followers of Christ, he has stuff for us to do. And those of us who don't know Christ, he says, turn to me. I'm worth it. I'm better. Living for yourself will never satisfy. So verse 9 and 10, Paul is filled with the Spirit. Now, is this a particular filling? It possibly is. It could also be just that he's walking in the Spirit. He's submitted to Christ because the Holy Spirit, right before this chapter, or earlier in the chapter, sent them out. He spoke. And sometimes we have, you know, I know there's other groups and churches around here. The Holy Spirit's very mystical, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and speaking in tongues, and all these other things. And, and, and it doesn't say that. The Holy Spirit isn't just a force like Star Wars, but rather he is a person. He is the triune part of the triune God. He is God, a very God. He spoke. Only God speaks. Forces don't speak, right? I mentioned last week, Star Wars, right? The, the force is fun. It's cool. You know, it's a kind of overarching thing in Star Wars. Of course, it's made up. It's fantasy, but fantasy's fun. Still talks about right and wrong, good and evil. But the force never speaks in Star Wars, right? You kind of tap into it for like, you know, juices and power and like kind of do the thing. That's not the Holy Spirit. He is a person who fills us and works through us, both convicts us and encourages us. And that's for both Christians, followers of Jesus, and those who are not. So it could be that he's filled with the Holy Spirit in this extra way, or it could just be that he's just walking in the Spirit. And it doesn't... <clears throat> It doesn't seem to be super clear as whether the filling is having to do with the curse of him going blind or calling him out, uh, that is, Elemis, Bar-Jesus, or not. I, I, it doesn't, it might, I didn't get in. Sometimes the original language, they have certain ways that words will relate to others. I didn't study that, so it could, but it doesn't appear in the English anyway. So we can see then he's here and he opposes him. So Elemis, bar Jesus, is opposing the truth, and then Saul doesn't just stand around and say, wow, I, just, I really wish you just wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wish he would stop, you know, deceiving this guy. I wish he would just, I, I don't know, we're just, he doesn't, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want Jesus. No, Sergius Paulus does want Jesus. He says, come, talk to me, tell me about this Messiah guy, right? Tell me more. What do you guys have to say? 
But as soon as there's a little opposition, Saul and Barnabas could have been like, ah, it's just not worth it. Just, ah, we should just be nice, right? We shouldn't be too mean. But he calls him out, doesn't he? He calls him out. And this is the place here. It also says Saul, who's also called Paul. And from henceforth, he's called Paul. He didn't change his name or copy Sergius Paulus. He just had two names. Like my name is Ricardo in Spanish. And if I were to go to Peru or someplace like that and live among there, I may very well go by that name. Just culturally slightly different. I'm not trying to hide that I'm American, but it may be just a little easier and more relevant. That's what's going on here. Saul is his Hebrew name. Paul, the same name, is Roman. So now he's in the Roman area. He's, he's more not hiding that he's Jewish or anything like that, but just simply that he is embracing the culture around him, but still proclaiming the Jewishness of Jesus, but not just for Jewish people only, but for everybody, for the whole world. Right? Remember, Christ came into the world, not to Israel only. So he says, and remember we said a moment ago, Bar-Jesus is son of Yeshua, right? Well, you might think, well, that's a little harsh, Paul. You're getting harsh right here. You son of the devil, verse 10. He's actually doing a play on words. He's not just like, you know, a cranky old lady or something. Oh, you son of that's the, that's the devil, right? Everything's the devil. No, he's saying, you're, you're, you're son of Jesus. You know, I know your dad's name's Joshua and everything. But this Christ, actually, the other Jesus, the real Jesus, you kind of seem like you're that son of, no, you're not actually even anything close. You're son of Diabolos. You're son of Satan. So where we get diabolical from. Diablo in Spanish is Satan as well. Your son of Diabolos. So he plays on words there. And he says, you're an enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy. I love that, villainy. And then, what is he doing? He's making crooked the straight paths of the Lord. Which means he has the straight paths of the Lord. But he's taking them like a hanger and bending them all up. You should teach what is right. You're, Jew, you're Jewish, man. What is wrong with you? This guy knows better. This guy knows more. And this, again, can apply to us today. People of us and those of us around us, those, of, those around us who know the right thing to do and they don't do it. Who, who hear Jesus. There's a difference between never really knowing and just kind of looking and saying, well, there's a creation. There must be a creator. This is... I wonder, you know, I don't know. And then you just kind of go on with your life kind of bumping around versus adamantly opposing Christ. There's a different judgment. But notice, and we'll skip to it right now, but notice God's mercy. He doesn't kill him, does he? Even though Elymas knows, he blinds him, which mirrors what happened to Saul when he's converted same thing. Jesus knocks him off his horse, right? He flattens all four of his tires. You know, they're driving across the country and going to go persecute people for Jesus or for God. And they don't like this Jesus Christian cult. So they're going to go get people for God. The same people who are worshiping God. And anyway, that's when he leaves. He goes to Damascus, you know, contextualization here. And he flattens all four of their van, you know, their convoy tires, breaks the whole engine and they're just there. And then he blinds them for days. We know the story. It's Acts 9. That mirrors what's going on here with Bar-Jesus. He also is blind. Both men, ironically or unironically, it's Saul who happened to, just a few decades later, or earlier, 12 years earlier, he went blind. And he pronounces this curse on Elymas. And he says the implication here, you should not make straight, the straight paths of the way of the Lord crooked. You should be teaching them right. You should be talking about what it means to know Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, the God of very God, the God of creation, the, the God who came in the world in Christ, in the flesh. And you're using magic? You're sorcery? You're conjuring up little pithy demons and trying to do little tricks for this guy? What is wrong with you, man? Certainly that is his thrust of the argument here. So he's not being mean, although you might think, ah, it's just, I don't know, is he being cruel? They're calling us, he's the devil, trickery, full of lies, deceit, expert, other translations say expert in deception, sleight of hand, huckster, charlatan. Now there's certainly charlatans, and we could 
have a long list of them that are on TV, Christian TV, so-called. They know better. And if they don't repent, judgment waits them. But you might be thinking, well, Paul's not being very Christ-like, though. Right? I mean, he's, you know, he's a man, and Jesus was perfect. He, was, he loved everybody. Well, Luke 6.45, New Living Translation, says, A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from your heart. And you're like, well, he didn't call him a devil, though. Okay. Well, John 8.44. You belong to your father, the devil. Oh, darn it. He's talking to the Pharisees. And these are the guys that know better, right? These are the guys that know God, they know the Bible, and they teach otherwise. They bear up heavy burdens. They tell people to do this and that. Keep all the rules. Do all the things. Go to your spice cabinet. Get out the garlic powder and the pepper and the cumin and this and the cracked red uh, uh, red peppers as well because, you know, spicy and we like that and the thyme and the dill. And just, just put it all out. Just do this. And you take it to the temple. And you say, here's my offering. And then you go that and you go to your chips and, you know, your lunch meats and a few pieces of bread because we're not going to, you know, we're doing 10%. We're tithing everything. That's what these guys did. They went through and tithed, that's a 10%, which it means everything. And they bear, bore up extra rules upon rules upon rules. Because there was a 430 year gap between the last book of the Old Testament and the first book of the New Testament. So in that time, no more speaking from God, no more prophets, people get creative as we are even today. So anyway, John 8, 44, he says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out his desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and refusing to uphold the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language because he is a liar and the father of lies. Oh, that's kind of harsh. That's actually Jesus isn't being very Christ-like, is he? Right? <laughs> But we, we have to dispel this view of Jesus that he's just meek and mild, you know, baggy pants, hacky sack, long flowing hair, just kind of, you know, bro hugging everybody and like, hey man, just chill out. It's not a big deal. Like, no. Now, Jesus is patient and merciful to the prostitute who are the lady who's with five dudes, five husbands and divorces and, and she's living with another guy. And he's, he's merciful to the, the, the leper and the guy who's blind and even the dead little girl and this dead guy. And he's merciful to the people who are broken, who are receptive to his truth. But those who stand in opposition with their chests firm, feet planted firmly, fists, fists clenched, gritting their teeth and staring at him and saying, no, that's who Jesus will crush. And he does crush them. We see this later in the book of Revelation. A humble heart God will not despise. Repeatedly, the word of God says, humble your heart. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And we see here, being under the mighty hand of God, sometimes it's a good thing. In this case, it's a bad thing. Jesus talks about all that the Father gives me into my hand. None will come out. So when you come to Christ, you're secure. There's a lot of misconception about losing salvation and you can fall out of faith. Well, if you can't fall into faith by your works, you can't fall out of faith by your works. Amen? You're securing Christ. When you raise the white flag, you surrender and say, I can't do this life. I am a sinner. I have lied. I've cheated. I've stolen. I've committed adultery. I've had other idols. I've worshiped other gods. I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive me. That's the heart that God saves. That's the person that he redeems. Not people, good people, right? Healthy people don't go to the doctor, right, generally? Dead people, sick people, those are the ones who need restoration. Those are the ones who need resurrection. Jesus talks all about that over and over and over again. So sometimes you have to be harsh. Elemis is opposing the truth. And Saul, now Paul, minces no words. And we can take that as an example 
It doesn't mean we walk around and tell everybody, oh, you're a daughter of the devil and a son of Satan, right? We don't do that. Generally, people, you love people. You bear with people's burdens because you realize, oh, you're a sinner just like them. They have questions. You don't know their past, so you talk. But you don't hide the truth. You live the truth. You pray for people. You read with people. You, you talk to people. But if someone says, no, I'm going to teach your children otherwise. I'm going to convince them or brainwash them. I'm going to tell them God doesn't exist. God doesn't love them. The Bible is a lie, etc., etc. Well, that's a different story. The gloves come off. Because those people know the truth and they're opposing it. But this is the happen. This happens over and over again in Acts, starting in Acts 2, where there's triumph and then there's sorrow and problem. And then triumph and sorrow and there's this off and on all the way through. We see the council, Peter and John, they heal the paralytic guy in chapter 4. They go to prison. They ask him, they tell him, hey, just stop talking about Jesus, the council guys, you know, the 70 elders up there in Jerusalem. Just shut up about Jesus, guys. Just, it's not a big deal. Just shut up. It's not, it's not hard. Be quiet. And they're like, I, well, we can't. I mean, if you think it's fine, I don't, it's up to you, but we're going to obey God. And God says, live for Christ. Tell people about what I have done in the world. This happens again. They arrest all the apostles later on. They beat them. 39 lashes, and they rejoice. I don't know if I'd be rejoicing if I got beat 39 times. I hope so, <laughs> but I doubt it. But these guys have immense faith because they not only trust God so much, they saw the risen Lord. And though we've not seen him, he still calls out everyone everywhere to repent, to cling to him, to trust him, to say, I am trustworthy, I am worthy. Because as human beings, we're not. We can't even please ourselves, right? We even, I, dis, I, I, I disappoint myself all the time. <laughs> and if I can't even please me, and I know what I want, quote unquote, how in the world can I please God? Right? But that's what's so good about the gospel. That's what's so good about having Christ, the hope of glory, the one who dwells with us. Not that we have to do all these extra works and all these extra things, but rather when we're saved, we're washed, we're clean, we get to do those things. We're privileged to do those things. Like I've said before, I do stuff like take out the trash, randomly do the dishes for Jenny, other things like that. I don't really like mowing my lawn, ever. Just kind of like, I don't like it. But the outside looks terrible when you don't do it, right? But I don't do those things so Jenny won't divorce me or she won't yell at me. Rather, I do them because I am the head of the family, just as Christ is the head of the church, the husband is the head of the wife, and so on. And I love my wife. I want to do these things for her, for the children, for the family in general. Not so she won't divorce me. And that's the difference between having a relationship with Christ and this works. You're working, you're giving money, you're serving, you're doing things for the Lord, you're praying for people, working, evangelism, giving people books, Doing whatever, meeting with people, fellowshipping with other people, not so God will strike, won't strike you down. It's a big difference. So, our implication here, take this plane in for a landing, is that the truth, though it's opposed, always still wins, doesn't it? Even still, Paul, now Paul, we'll call him Paul because that's what it says. We've switched here. He is harsh. He's direct with somebody who deserves to be harsh and direct with. Because this man's not mincing words. Well, Paul's not going to either. God's truth always wins, even if it doesn't feel like it. And that's what we can remember. Even if everything seems black and foggy and murky and terrible, your face is literally down in the ground, you can't see anything. Doesn't seem like Christ is on the throne anymore. Doesn't seem like we're going to win. Doesn't seem like this is really true. Doesn't seem like I'm really forgiven of my sin. Doesn't really seem like I'm really loved. Well, again, as the adage goes, facts and faith in particular don't care about your feelings, right? It doesn't matter what you feel like. It matters what God has already said. 
And that's what we trust, not our feelings, not our emotions. That's why emotionalism and I'm not up here clapping and trying to yell at you and rile you up, that's only going to last as much as cotton candy satisfies you. Right? Nobody eats cotton candy for dinner, generally, unless you're a small child. And certainly you're not going to do it every day. Right? Let's be real here. It's not steak. Wow, that was really loud. Sorry. It's not steak. We'll just move, move this down a little bit. Okay. This microphone is great. Sometimes, sometimes it's weird. Anyway, cotton candy is not steak. It's not a burger. It's not chicken. It's not tofu, if you prefer. I don't know. But it's, it's nothing. It's just sugar, fluffed up sugar. And that's how emotionalism type stuff is. And we see this all the time. So, we can trust what God has already said. We can trust his word because he's the faithful one. Not me, but him. So he has to now lead people, be led out. Similar to Paul. Probably doing tricks with his hands. And, you know, this is similar to what we saw with Philip and Peter where he, uh, uh, Simon Magus, remember him also, he's there in Samaria, he's doing tricks, and he's making people amazed, and the same word for amazing people, he's, you know, doing magic stuff, he then comes around and sees what happens in the teaching of Peter and Philip, and he's amazed. So the amazer becomes amazed. Well, similarly, though it kind of leaves as a parenthesis, we don't know what happens to Bar-Jesus. Simon Magus, some believe he turned to Christ and some didn't, based on the context. Saul certainly did. But the proconsul believed, didn't he? But notice very closely, and this is why I'm again talking about emotion and, and just tricks and other things. Those things don't satisfy. Jesus even condemns that when they made the fish and the bread. He doesn't say, well, it's just because of this. They like this, but it's really, you need to trust me. This fish and bread, you're going to be hungry again. You're going to drink water. You're going to be thirsty again. But Sergius Paulus, here, last verse, he says he's astonished at the miracles. No, at the teaching of the Lord. So let us be astonished at God's teaching. Let us be astonished at Christ coming into the world to save sinners. So the whole thrust of this passage is truth triumphs over lies. Quote from Brian Vickers and Wolf move on to the Lord's Supper. His commentary, he says, importantly, and this is very, very good, the narrative of Bar-Jesus highlights the conversion of a Gentile Roman official, the gospel that is now penetrating every level and strata of society. Even prominent, seemingly unreached public figures are within the reach of the Spirit through the word of the Lord. Notice that. It's through the preaching of the gospel, through the preaching of God's word. That's why I'm not just up here with my opinion, but rather this. You don't want to hear what I have to say only. Trust me. As with Saul of Tarsus, he goes on. It is easy to fall into the trap of thinking that even though conversion's possible, like we do today, oh, he's possible, but it's unlikely, even if they hear the gospel. The book of Acts dispels any reservation concerning the power of the good news of Jesus Christ, end quote. So he says, even though it's possible, people can be saved, but I mean, they're really not, though. And we do that, too, with prayer, right? We'll pray for people or pray for a particular thing, and it's kind of like, yeah, but God's probably pretty busy, probably doesn't really care that much. He probably, I mean, maybe he doesn't have the power to do it. Yeah, who are we kidding? You know, we do that all the time, don't we? And we shouldn't, because it's all wrong. Just because we hear a no doesn't mean God didn't hear but that gospel is that gospel is what saves us. The particular life, death, and resurrection of Christ. The one who surrenders to that, who says, I can't do this life. I can't be perfect, Lord. I can't do these things for you. That's why Jesus came into the world. Right? The famous John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And it's not just high, you know, earthly, you know, living in heaven and got my ticket. I'm just going to hang out here and do whatever. No, there's, you're not dead yet, right? We're all, I'm looking at you. So we have stuff to do. Either repent because you don't know Christ or cling to him and walk in the things that he calls you to do. And if you haven't been doing that for a long time, well, there's still plenty of time left, isn't there? 
That's, the, that's what's so good about the gospel. It washes sinners, because we're all broken, every single person. Every single person who's ever lived saved Jesus alone. That's why we need him, because he washes and redeems. It's not a, well, you work, I'm going to forgive this, but from now on, you better not mess up. No, that's not the gospel. Or, well, I'm going to forgive up to a point. 99%, but you got to do 1%. No, that's not the gospel. Well, you got to do like, you know, you got to do these things for me and this all checklist and all this and do this. And then, and then when you're dead and I look it over, I might let you in. We might have eternal bliss and glory the way we should have before the fall of creation. That's not the gospel either. Rather, as I said earlier, it's the power of God to salvation to all who believe. Simply, you get washed. You're one way. And if you know the, the TV show, The Chosen, I was one way. I met him. And to completely different. It's a paraphrase of kind of their mantra for the show. I was a certain way. I was doing certain things. I had certain desires, certain affections. I met Christ. I understood my sin. He washed me. He changed me through faith alone. Nothing else. Faith alone. No works. Nothing else. And now I'm something different. So when you are that, you're changed. And we celebrate that here monthly. We celebrate that through communion, Lord's table, Eucharist. There's different words for it. That's what's here. It's the bread and the cup. It's nothing fancy. It's nothing magical. It's not snack time. You're not getting more grace. But what it is here, here at this church particularly, some churches require only members of that church. We're not, but you are required to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus. If you've been baptized, you're walking with the Lord, then come and partake. Although if you're not, that's okay. Fine, remain. Because Paul does warn us, and I'll read the passage, but he warns us to not do that. So Nicole's going to play, Seth's going to assist me, and basically we'll take the elements. You want to come up, you're a believer, you hold the elements, we'll all partake together. But if you've got sin against somebody, and you are a Christian, still don't come. It's far better to remain. And anybody who doesn't come, those of us who come up and partake, none of your business, okay? Don't worry about, that's between them and the Lord. So Nicole, like I said, is going to play. I'm going to read Corinthians 11. 